Welcome to Sound Bites, hosted by registered dietitian nutritionist Melissa Joy Dobbins. Welcome to the Sound Bites Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Joy Dobbins, a registered dietitian nutritionist. And on the show, we delve into the science, the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. Today's episode is all about eggs. And I'm so excited. I had to do it. You guys know I love the food puns. It's about eggs and cognition, current research and updates on the naturally nutrient-rich egg. And you guys know that I always talk about nutrient-rich foods. So we're going to talk about how eggs fit into just about any healthy eating pattern, including plant-based eating. But we're going to focus a big chunk of time on cognition because I'm really interested in this research. Now, this episode is a partnership with the Egg Nutrition Center, and we thank them for their sponsorship and support. My guest today is Dr. Mickey Rubin. He is the executive director of the Egg Nutrition Center. Dr. Rubin has a bachelor's of science in kinesiology, a master's degree in exercise and sport science, and a PhD in exercise physiology. And his research interest included exercise endocrinology, which sounds really interesting to me being a certified diabetes educator, also sports nutrition, and the effects of dietary interventions on cardiometabolic health outcomes. Welcome to the show, Mickey. Happy to be here, Melissa. Thanks for having me. Yeah, as I said, I'm so excited <laughs> to talk to you. I love it. So tell us a little bit more about your background, your education, your career, and what brought you to work with the Egg Nutrition Center, and maybe more about your role there. I know that you were at the Dairy Council before because you and I were there at the same time, but yeah. tell us a little bit more about your background. This is one of my favorite topics, so feel free to cut me off if I go on too long because I love talking. <laughs> I love talking to students about you know their career path and you know how I got to where I am. So I got into really into science, really based upon my interest in both exercise and nutrition. And I was as an undergraduate, you know, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but they tell you you're supposed to study the things that you're passionate about. And I was passionate about learning as much as I could about the science of exercise and nutrition, the biochemistry and the physiology of exercise and nutrition. And so I took that and ran with it. And I went on to do a master's degree. I chose the programs based on the fact that I would not necessarily be focused just on exercise or just on nutrition, but places where I thought I could do both. Mm -hmm. uh, I was interested in muscle. I was interested in hormones and exercise, which is the endocrine piece. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in nutrition and how that all interacts. And so I ended up doing a master's degree and then a PhD. Uh, and then as I was completing my PhD, I decided that traditional academic path wasn't necessarily for me. Uh, and I was looking at other options, you know, what could I do with my broad-based knowledge in nutrition and exercise as a scientist? And I started a career in the food industry. And so that was first where I started was at Kraft Foods uh, here in Chicago. From there, I went on to work at what's called a contract research organization, uh, which is essentially a research clinic. It's uh, not university affiliated, but it did research and clinical trials for both the food and pharmaceutical industries, which was really fun because I got to see like all the things that all the different companies were doing and had in development and work with all the scientists at these other companies and trying to test their products and understand them better. And so that was a really great learning experience from there. And then after that, as you said, I, I moved on to uh, the National Dairy Council, uh, where I oversaw their nutrition research program for about eight years. And that was really my first experience in working in agriculture and working for farmers. So the Dairy Council, as well as Egg Nutrition Center, American Egg Board, we work on behalf of farmers. It, they were the nonprofit organizations and farmers all contribute funds for research and promotion purposes of their products. And that to me is where I really found my niche. Mm -hmm. I uh, I was a typical, you know, typical suburban kid growing up. I was not very connected to where my food was coming from. But when I started working on behalf of farmers and I got to meet them and talk to them, 
first of all, how passionate they are about scientific research. Mm. Uh, you know, that was really rewarding because they were very supportive of f their funds going towards research and understanding more about the foods that they produce. Mm. And so I immediately had friends in these <laughs> farmers because I knew we were all on the same page about the importance of science and the importance of research. Interesting. So I did that for eight years and it was a really rewarding experience at Dairy. And then I had the opportunity to come just down the street here with the American Egg Board and the Egg Nutrition Center, a very similar role, but just a different organization and a little bit more of a leadership role overseeing both not only the research, but also the nutrition communications piece as well. I think most of my listeners know that I'm based in Chicago and yeah, you're in the suburb next to me. Yeah. And so when you say, yeah, National Dairy Council, then down the street to the Egg Nutrition Center, uh, yeah, different food group, but same sort of checkoff program where like you said, the farmers support it. And it's so cool to hear how interested and supportive they were of the research. And uh, I'm sure excited to hear of all the different work that, you know, you were doing on their behalf. So you had mentioned, you know, yeah, growing up being in the suburbs, I was curious, what made you interested in science and, you know, biochemistry and all of that to begin with? Was it just a subject area that you were good at or, and sports in particular, like, were you active in sports? Yeah, so I wasn't very good at science, actually, <laughs> at all. And then, you know, when it came to just sort of basic science classes like chemistry or biology, you know, more bench top, very, you know, just sort of not really applied to anything in the real world. I had a lot of trouble just sort of thinking that through. I went, it wasn't until I got into college and I saw that, you know, you can really apply some of these real world things like exercise and nutrition to that chemistry or biochemistry. That's when it all clicked. Mm -hmm. And that's when I really started to understand it. I wasn't when, just the chemistry by itself no thanks. Mm -hmm. But when you take that chemistry and you apply it to, you know, physiology and you apply it to nutrition and nutrients and exercise and all that, that's when it really all came together for me. Primarily growing up, I was, you know, interested in sports. I was interested in nutrition as a high schooler. I, I was interested in sports and then I became interested in nutrition. That's when I first started. I'm not much of a cook, but I started to try to cook my own meals because I didn't think the you know, that we were having at home were nutritious enough. Mm -hmm. And so I had, so I started to do my own sort of experiments and I've always experimented with myself on diets and, you know, trying the, the new thing or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, that had started all the way back then when I was a teenager. <laughs> okay. That sounds like a very interesting uh, episode we could do as a follow-up. <laughs> yeah. We could probably <laughs> dig into a lot there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. Was it any particular sport that you were in or just all kinds of sports? I was a football player and a weightlifter. That was really my thing. And I wanted to try to figure out the physiology and biochemistry of muscle and how nutrition contributes to that. Excellent. Very interesting. Okay, cool. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So before we jump into cognition, I just want to kind of, again, give a shout out that we know that eggs are nutrient rich and we know that eggs are a good or an excellent source of eight essential nutrients. So can you just kind of top line that for us? And then we're going to talk more about the cognition research and then some also um, interesting aspects with regard to plant-based diets, budget-friendly. We're going to get into food waste and also maybe some of the popular myths or misconceptions about the color of eggs, cage-free, things like that. Sure. Yeah. Well, as you mentioned, eggs are naturally nutrient-rich. I mean, there aren't that many foods out there that can claim a good or excellent source. So that's either a good source would be 10% of the DV or an excellent source is 20% of the daily value of eight essential nutrients. So, and that includes protein, that includes choline, B12. The nutrient package of foods like eggs, I think are, when we talk about foods and nutrients, I think we can talk about them together, but we tend to forget about the unique nutrient packages. You know, whether it's eggs or whether it's milk or whether it's yogurt, we forget that these are unique packages of nutrients and sometimes the sum is greater than the parts. Mm. And I think that's definitely the case when you look at something like eggs. A lot of people think of eggs as protein, mm -hmm. which is great. Six grams of high quality protein in a large egg. You know, it's a good source of protein, 12% of the DV. But I want to make sure that everybody knows that, yeah, absolutely think about protein in your eggs. But don't forget about the other nutrients and especially the nutrients in the yolk. Because a lot of the protein is obviously in the white. There's actually protein in the yolk as well, but all the other vitamins and minerals are mainly in the yolk. And so don't forget about your yolk. Don't throw away your yolk. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because 
I was an outpatient dietitian and a clinical dietitian at the beginning of my career. Mm -hmm. And, you know, do remember talking about egg whites and, you know, with cardiovascular health and diabetes, of course, as a diabetes educator. But I don't hear that much these days. So hopefully that's like an old, you know, recommendation. And I was going to ask you later, but I think it's a good fit now. Let's talk briefly about the whole cholesterol, cardiovascular health, diabetes health, because I think we can, you know, really address that right off the bat. And so that we can get into maybe the more juicy or more important topics, not that those aren't important, because those, you know, people still wonder and question that. So it's very important. But I think it's, it's something that you can address pretty specifically right now. I love science, but I also I'm kind of a history buff as well. And I think the example of eggs is one of the most fascinating things about the history of nutrition science. Uh, because you look back several decades ago when we were first starting to get dietary guidelines and low fat became a thing and lower cholesterol became a thing. That was the best science of the time. Mm. It really was. I mean, you know, I don't like to look back at those early studies and say, oh, we got it all wrong. I mean, you know, that was the best available data of the time. And so science evolves, methods get better. We start to ask more specific questions. With our new methodologies, we're able to get better, clearer answers. And that's basically what happened over the course of several decades. If you look back in the 70s, and it was sort of the idea that the dietary cholesterol that you eat you know, will increase the cholesterol in your blood. And that was sort of taken at face value. Mm. And then you know, a lot of the research that started more into the 80s and to the 90s, and a lot of the research was started when the American Egg Board uh, and the Egg Nutrition Study first started funding scientific research. Some of those studies actually tested nutritional interventions. Let's actually feed people eggs and see what happens to their blood cholesterol. What they found was that that is not a very clear-cut relationship. Just because you consume dietary cholesterol in the form of an egg does not necessarily translate to increases in cholesterol in your blood. Mm -hmm. It's just not that simple of a story. And in fact, the vast majority of the population experience no increase in cholesterol at all. In some cases, it's both an increase in both LDL and HDL. So your ratio of your sort of quote unquote good and bad cholesterol basically is unchanged depending on the study you look at or the intervention that you look at. So it's really a success story of science that you know, we had early methodology, and it was the best of its time. And those methods improved over time, and we start to learn more and more and more. And it really is just a shining example of science in action. I love that. Thank you. You brought us up to speed with history really well, because we've seen so many things in the media, just like we had it all wrong, and mm -hmm. dietitians are telling people the wrong thing. And like you said, it's a great example. And it brings home the point and I talk about, you know, research and critical thinking a lot on, on the podcast. And it really makes a finer point about how the science is evolutionary, not yes. revolutionary, and yes. that that's the nature of it. So can we just get on board with that and keep moving forward? And, you know, people want things black and white, and they feel like partly because of the media that, you know, it's flipping, flopping, coffee's good for you one day, coffee's bad for you one day, whatever. That's the best example, right? Every It depends on the week, right? <laughs> it depends on the week. So thank you. That, that was really helpful. And so let's just answer this quick question then. So with people who have diabetes, who are obviously, when somebody has diabetes, they're at increased risk for cardiovascular disease. So can people with diabetes have eggs? And is there a specific recommendation? Absolutely. So there's some very recent data on this, actually, with in terms of diabetes risk with egg consumption, as well as, you know, some clinical trials have looked at uh, individuals with type 2 diabetes and what happens when they consume eggs. There was actually a large clinical trial that was done and it was published out of Australia where they actually fed individuals gave them an egg intervention, I think believe it was uh, an egg a day intervention uh, with individuals with type 2 diabetes, and they showed no negative outcomes in terms of cholesterol levels or their cardiovascular disease risk factors. So they really did show that eggs can be a part of a diabetes-friendly diet, for sure. When we look at the research that there was some research early on that suggested potentially a link between a consumption and type 2 diabetes risk. But lately, as I said, you know, the science evolves and our methods get better and we learn different things. 
And uh, the latest research that was published last year is actually a study that was uh, sponsored by Ig Nutrition Center showed that you know some of those early studies only occurred in the U.S. and the studies outside the U.S. did not see this relationship with type 2 diabetes and A consumption. And what this latest study found is that some of these early studies in the U.S. did not account for other factors very well that are more closely linked with type 2 diabetes. And when you're able to single out the uh, association with eggs alone, that link no longer exists. Mm -hmm. So again, it's just another example of how we're just our methods get better and the way we look at it improves and we learn more than what we did yesterday. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, that's great news for people with diabetes. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. So like I said, we know that eggs are nutrient rich. And like you said, people tend to think of eggs as protein, but there's all these other important nutrients. And we address the cholesterol issue, which people are familiar with that history, at least mm -hmm. they're you know familiar with that concept. But I don't think most people realize that eggs have certain nutrients that are important for brain health and cognition. So that's what I really wanted to discuss with you today in depth. Tell us what nutrients are in eggs that are important for cognition and kind of walk us through some of the research and some of the findings. So one of the things that I think is really important for everybody to maybe go back and look at is a review a recommendation that came out just last year in 2018 from the American Academy of Pediatrics. And that review was about the importance of nutrition during the first thousand days of life. So, you know, all the way from maternal nutrition all the way into infant and toddler nutrition. And what the American Academy of Pediatrics said in their recommendation was that this is a critical time period in development. And for which if there are nutrient deficiencies, you might not be able to recover from. And so the AAP listed several nutrients that are important for brain health, brain health and development, protein being one, B vitamins being another, uh, you know, a whole slew of nutrients. And one of the nutrients that they pointed out that was on that list was choline. Choline is not found in a lot of foods in high, high amounts. Eggs are probably one of the highest amounts of choline available, certainly of, of, of commonly consumed foods, about 150 milligrams of choline in one egg. The best source of choline is actually liver. Not a lot of people out there eating a lot of liver, but it's no. a very, very high choline. <laughs> Whenever I give presentations on the topic, I'm like, show of hands, who loves liver? And not a lot of hands go up. But there's a lot of choline in eggs and, and, and seafood, actually. Uh, salmon, a really good source of choline as well. But choline is really important for brain health and development and neurocognition because it's important for production of what's called acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that's really important for the neurological system. It's important for not only you know, a lot of different aspects of physiology, muscle contraction as well, but it's also really important for neurocognitive development and for developing sort of those neural connections in the brain as children are growing up. And you mentioned that few foods contain high quantities of choline. Uh, many foods have it, but not in really high quantities. It's my understanding that even most multivitamin supplements contain little if any. That's true. Uh, there's not much, uh, especially in, we hope to start seeing it more in prenatal vitamins. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, there was a recommendation from the uh, American Medical Association from one of their meetings uh, a couple of years ago that recommended choline in prenatal supplements, but it's not all that common. But the most commonly consumed food uh, where you can get a big chunk of it, two large eggs get you to half the daily value for choline. So it's actually quite substantial. Do we have any numbers on how much women, uh, pregnant women, are mm. consuming to get an idea of how many people are lacking? So it's a big number <laughs> of people that are lacking. When you look back, uh, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans review back in 2015, they found that 90% of the population are not achieving the AI, the adequate intake level for choline. So only 10% actually are achieving it. Mm -hmm. uh, the number is very same number essentially for pregnant women not achieving. It's because uh, the recommendation uh, for pregnant women is actually slightly higher mm -hmm. uh, than general population. So a lot of folks not achieving that recommendation. It sounds very on par with how many people are not getting enough fruits and vegetables. And uh, yet, you know, we know we need to get fruits and vegetables, but maybe we are not making the egg choline connection. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the first thousand days and pregnancy, obviously. Let's talk about once you have the baby. Mm hmm. When would be a, an appropriate time to start feeding eggs for the infant? Yeah, so I think the way which we're talking about it, 
you know, the research in this area is really growing. Right now, the 2020 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee is convening. They're doing their scientific review for the recommendations that'll come out next year. And for the first time, they're looking at recommendations for just this age group, this B to 24 mm-hmm. age group. So we're really looking forward to hearing uh, what they recommend. But really, it's that time period where you can start really finding ways to incorporate some of these nutrient-rich foods like eggs into uh, diets of children. Because when you think about a scrambled egg and how easy that is to tell us how soft it is and it's easy to pick up, and then it's so nutrient-rich at the same time. And then on top of that, you know, we get a lot of questions about allergies, and, mm-hmm. and everybody's very concerned about allergies. Allergies seem like they're you know so much more prominent in children today, you hear a lot about peanut allergies. My kids can't bring peanut butter jelly sandwiches Mm-mm. to school, you know. So, yeah. but you know, again, another recommendation from the American Academy of Pediatrics on food allergy is actually recommending now early introduction is best. We used to be, you know, my kids aren't that old. I have my oldest is 10 years old and, you know, we even 10 years ago we were like, when do we well, let's be careful. We don't want to, you know, introduce anything too soon because what if they're allergic? We, you know, we, we everybody was took a very cautious approach and now the recommendation is sort of the opposite of that. It's it's introduced early because when you introduce early, that actually reduces the risk for allergy later in life. So this is a really critical time period, not only to get some of these key nutrients that we know are important for neurodevelopment, development, but also the reduced risk of allergy for early introduction is also a key factor. Yeah. I know my son is 11 and I remember when I was pregnant, like I ended up asking a friend of mine who was a nurse who had kids already. And, and I was like, am I supposed to, she was actually a pediatric nurse. Mm-hmm. And I you know, am I supposed to, can I eat peanut butter during my pregnancy or whatever? So yeah, I remember that vividly. And in fact, relating to this earlier introduction topic and peanuts, I did an episode um, with Sherry Coleman Collins, the peanut RD on peanut allergy prevention. It was a couple years ago when we first started hearing about the first thousand days. And um, I thought this was you know, such interesting information. That's episode 68, if anybody wants to kind of go back and, and check that out. But yeah. So that's really interesting. Obviously, you know, the infant would need to be, you know, when solid foods are introduced at four to six months and developmentally, you know, ready. Sure, absolutely. But to your point, you know, scrambled eggs, even hard boiled eggs, you know, they're soft. But yeah, so as far as like what they're sitting up and able to chew and swallow or gum or whatever. (laughs) Right, exactly, exactly. And can you tell me more about some of the research with choline? Yeah, so what we're seeing right now is really exciting. What we're seeing is that in mothers who consume choline, who the, well, compared to mothers who consume less choline, we're actually seeing better cognitive outcomes with their children. So uh, there's actually a randomized controlled trial that showed that women consuming choline during the third trimester, actually their children at one years of age actually had better cognitive performance than the children of mothers that had less choline in their diets. And we're seeing that in both clinical trials and observational research. So it's really, really exciting to see that connection from the maternal diet to the outcomes in the infants and toddlers. And then on the other side of the age spectrum, we're seeing the same thing. There are some uh, observational studies that are showing that individuals with higher choline in their diet actually have reduced risk for cognitive decline. So it's it's not just the beginning of life thing. It's it's an all throughout life and in aging as well. Oh, that's great news. Very interesting. I think that when it comes to commonly consumed foods, like I said, you know, eggs are an excellent source and something that's so easy to incorporate into any diet pattern and something that's um, that really is uh, a good food for kids to start trying to uh, incorporate into their diets. Starting with pregnancy and going up through yeah. teens to even adults. Okay, so let's talk about the other nutrient. I should mention I actually worked in a high-risk OB clinic when I had left the National Dairy Council. I actually worked for Midwest Dairy Council, but I was a National Dairy Council spokesperson. And uh, that was back in early 2011. And so the the nutrient that you're going to talk about, I was familiar with it being important for eye health, but I understand there's new research to show about the role in cognition. So go ahead and tell us about that one. Absolutely. I think we're we're talking about lutein. And uh, lutein is, um, a lot of people are, as you said, familiar with it for eye health, its connection with um, reduced risk for macular degeneration. Lutein is, um, it's really the pigment in eggs. It's, It's found in eggs. It's found in large quantities in green leafy vegetables. It's really the pigment that you find in vegetables. Uh, and when you consume lutein, 
lutein actually accumulates in your eye and is associated with you know eye health and that reduced risk for macular degeneration. Eggs are actually, when you look at the numbers, really a fraction of the amount of lutein in an egg relative to, say, spinach or a green leafy vegetable. But uh, one of the important points about lutein is that, like a lot of other fat-soluble vitamins, lutein and carotenoids are fat-soluble. There's research to show that lutein on a quantity-for-quantity basis compared with lutein in spinach is actually more bioavailable in an egg uh, because it's coming along with the fatty acids that are in the egg yolk. It's actually more bioavailable than you would get it from a green leafy vegetable. In fact, the research has shown that combining your eggs with your vegetables might actually be your best bet because there was a study that ENC sponsored uh, at Purdue University that was published uh, just a couple of years ago that examined co-consuming uh, hard-boiled egg with raw vegetables. And not only was lutein uh, more bioavailable uh, in the eggs with vegetables condition, it also improved the bioavailability of the nutrients that came from the vegetables. Mm. So your egg on top of your salad might be your best bet. Wow, that's great news. I've been talking recently about how plants and animals can work together. Yeah. This is a great example, you know, the the synergies that we get when we have, you know, nobody eats just one food at a yeah. time or just yeah. one nutrient at a time. Exactly. And so lutein, also getting back to the cognition piece, we're seeing the same relationships with lutein that we see with choline. With lutein, we're seeing that one way to measure lutein is not just necessarily lutein in the blood. You actually can measure lutein by examining macular pigment. It's a really cool, non-invasive way. It looks like you're getting an eye test at the eye doctor's office, but there's a, a machine that allows us to examine the lutein content of the eye, uh, what's called macular pigment optical density, MPOD uh, is what I call it. So what the research is showing is that in children who have higher levels of MPOD, higher levels of macular pigment, there's actually improved cognitive function and cognitive scores and actually some studies that have shown improved academic performance. This is not just in kids. It's actually lasting throughout life, actually. There's, there's similar research with MPOD, macular pigment, and aging individuals uh, showing improved cognitive function. That's fabulous. On a side note, I recently had my 23andMe done and pretty clean bill of health, but I am genetically at increased risk for macular degeneration. Oh, wow. Yeah, who knew? So I haven't done my 23andMe yet. I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> it's interesting. There's, you know, with the science, as a scientist, you'll, you know, appreciate this. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's not saying that I will get macular degeneration. It's, you know, I'm at increased risk for it. But it says things like, you know, these are two of the things that were, they had wrong about me, that I'm much less likely to like cilantro and I can't get enough cilantro. Okay, just bring it on. That's so interesting. Yeah. And I'm much less likely to have a widow's peak and I have a widow's peak. So I'm like, okay. It's, cilantro is a very polarizing herb. I have a friend that just, I mean, he calls it the devil weed. I mean, he absolutely <laughs> hates it, doesn't even want to be in the same room with it. And um, my daughter actually is along those same lines. She she can spot cilantro oh from gosh. across the room. So we think she's got whatever that is. If there was somebody living in my house who had that, I don't know if we could get along. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay, so I didn't mean to, to derail that. But oh, but if you are, are interested more in 23andMe in that sort of vein, I did do a podcast interview. Um, I had my DNA more from a nutrition and weight and health standpoint. It's the Nutrisystem DNA blue kit something. I, I'm totally blanking on it. But a podcast interview was with Courtney McCormick, the dietitian from Nutrisystem. And I took the test and went through all my results. So that's kind of a fun episode if you want to check that out. So back to lutein. And maybe because I just turned 51, I, you know, I am not only having the increased risk for macular degeneration, but yeah, I think about cognition, I think about brain health, I think about, you know, as I age. And so I'm glad we got to address that piece, because it's not just for pregnant women and infants and children and teens, it's for everybody. It's important for all of us. I mean, I think we can all agree that first of all, without our health, not much else matters. And you know, we want to stay sharp and have good cognition as we age. I do want you to talk about the blue light thing because I thought that was interesting. One of the things, you know, the eye health benefits of lutein, and as I said, when you consume lutein, it does accumulate 
in your macula, the best way to describe it, nature's sunglasses. Mm. You know, when you have that lutein accumulating in your eye, it does help protect the eye from blue light. And all of us are getting a lot of blue light exposure because we're always on our computers or all, always on our phones. So that's something that's also uh, you know, another benefit of lutein in our diets. Excellent. So I wanted to address that real quick. And so let's go back to how eggs can fit into plant-based diets. I'm glad you talked about how the eggs can help absorb um, some of the nutrients in plant foods. So maybe that is a good transition into talking about how eggs can fit into almost any healthy eating pattern, including the plant-forward, plant-based diet. I get this question. I'm sure you're, you get this question. I mean, from, and all your uh, listeners get the question. Anybody that works in nutrition or says they work in nutrition, they automatically get you know looped into a nutrition conversation uh, in social situations. And it's like, well, what, what should I eat? What's the best diet? I, I've learned over the years in these conversations to just say, you know, there's not just that one best diet. There's just a lot of avenues to a really healthy diet. I mean, just look at the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. There's three healthy dietary patterns just in the Dietary Guidelines, You know, whether it's the healthy US, the Mediterranean, or the healthy vegetarian. Those are all healthy dietary patterns. There's a lot of ways to get to that healthy endpoint. But eggs fit in all of them. They're actually in all three of the healthy patterns that are in the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. They're in the, they're in, in the healthy vegetarian pattern because the vegetarian pattern has both eggs and dairy foods uh, contained in it because it's just hard to get you know, the key nutrients uh, that are in eggs or, or in, in, in the case of milk without consuming uh, those foods as part of your dietary pattern. So there's a lot of ways to go. There's, you know, I, obviously there's a lot of folks interested in the keto world right now, and that certainly works for some people. Uh, but again, eggs fit. It just, there's just so many different ways to get there. Excellent. Now, as a former supermarket dietitian, I often talk um, and still do media interviews about eating on a budget. And we know that eggs are so budget friendly mm -hmm. and they're versatile and convenient. So let's talk about that briefly with maybe an emphasis on how eggs can help us reduce food waste, because that's one of my favorite topics as well. Yeah, well, I mean, you hit the nail on the head when it comes to the affordability. One large egg, 15 cents. And when you look at the nutrient package that you're getting for 15 cents or 15 cents on average, I mean, it's really remarkable how packed it is with nutrients, whether it's, you know, obviously we talked about protein, but all the other nutrients as well. I mean, it's really the best bang for your buck, nutritionally speaking. Mm -hmm. However you like your eggs, there's generally not that much, aside from the shell, <laughs> which you know, just gets, gets tossed, there's not much that goes to waste when you're cooking with eggs. Okay. I have to tell you a really funny story. Um, it's short. Well, people on the show who listen to the show would have heard the longer version. But when my son had his pediatric annual physical last year, the pediatrician actually was like, make sure you get your calcium-rich foods like spinach, broccoli, and eggs. And I thought, she just must have made a mistake. And then she repeated herself <laughs> later. And I was like, hmm, I wonder if she's like she's missing something. <laughs> right. She, and part of the whole story is she either didn't know or forgot that I was a dietitian. And I yeah. did address this with her later, but I didn't at the time because I wanted to hear all the other stuff she had to say. Yeah. Um, yeah but I was yeah. like, yeah, you know, um, unless you eat the shell, maybe there's calcium in the shell. I don't know. But Obviously, we don't encourage yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, there is, but yeah, exactly. I don't eat the shell. I don't. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for anybody. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, yeah. we know they're nutrient rich, but not a significant or maybe any source of calcium. There is, but it's. I think it's like two percent of the daily value. So it's like we certainly can't say good source. Yeah. You know, right. It. It, it, it's there, but it's certainly not as much as you would find in other foods. Yeah. So you know, like you said, excellent bang for the buck for nutrient-rich food, you almost can't afford not to have eggs in your diet, right? Exactly. You mentioned hard-boiled eggs. We always have hard-boiled eggs on hand in the fridge for meals or snacks. Um, and my husband makes a mean egg salad. Like, I don't even oh. try. And I love deviled eggs. But I wanted to ask you what your favorite recipe or way to prepare eggs is. So I'm very old school when it comes to my eggs. I've seen a lot of people that, you know, try to do a lot of different things with eggs and try to make eggs quicker and easier. Uh, I definitely understand that because there is a preparation. A lot of folks like the, um, you ever see the coffee cup uh, scrambled egg oh, where yeah. you just kind of put the coffee cup in the microwave. Did that throughout and, college, yep. Yeah, you know, and I think that's great because it's quick and it's easy. But for me, there's just nothing better than my eggs in my skillets, mm -hmm. whether it's my scrambled or whether it's my once over easy and I've got my technique down that I get just get the yolk in the just the right 
you know, consistency. Mm. I, I, that, that's the way I like it. I was, my wife does most of the cooking in our house, but there's a few things that are my domain. <laughs> the eggs <laughs> are my domain. The scrambled eggs, that's my domain. Stay mm-hmm. away from the skillet. <laughs> I've got this covered because it's got to be just that right sort of consistency, custardy, consistency, mm. you know, not too much, not too little. Then the same for the over easy egg. It's got to be just that right, not too runny, not too hard, just mm-hmm. sort of right there in yeah. you know, perfect spot. I think people are picky with eggs like they are with bananas. You know, everybody has their own little like preference. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's funny you mentioned it because I'm the scrambled egg person, but my husband is in charge of the omelet, even mm-hmm. though... About 15 years ago, I attended a supermarket dietitian forum in New York City, and I met the Omelet King. The Omelet King. Um, Howard Helmer, the Omelet King. This guy's amazing. He was working with the Egg Nutrition Center and um, or the Egg Board. He holds the Guinness World Record for the fastest omelet cooker. Wow. He made 427 omelets in 30 minutes, and he also can make one omelet in 42 seconds. Wow. But those numbers I looked up, but what I did not forget over these 15 years, and my regular listeners know I don't have a very good memory. Um, I need, maybe I need more eggs. <laughs> the perfect omelet is made with two eggs and two tablespoons of water. He says, if you're making scrambled eggs, you can use milk. But with the omelet, you want to use water because that steams and it makes it fluffy. So I'll see if I can find some yeah. the recipe or the video or something with him. He made such an impression on me. Like I said, I n- I'll never forget it. He was He's, he's great. I'll see if I can put that in the show notes at soundbitesrd.com. <laughs> well, it's an omelet for me. It also has to have cheese to make it the perfect omelet. So we got can't forget about that. <laughs> Absolutely. And well, it's funny you say that because, I mean, I love cheese. I have an entire cheese drawer. I put the cheese in the vegetable drawer because the vegetables (laughs) I need to see so that they don't go bad, or as I like to say, get forgotten and go rotten. But the cheese, I know where to find it and I'm not going to forget about it. So I put all that in the, in the vegetable drawer, but my husband puts too much cheese in the omelets. It's just too rich. It's just too much. But anyway, you know, like I said, we can be all picky. Moderation with everything. There's a too little and a too much. You got to find that middle ground. Yeah. And I never thought I would hear myself say too much cheese, but it's a, it's a thing with the omelet. We forgot to talk about food waste, so I want to go back to that. Mm -hmm. I think you have some suggestions and ideas about how eggs can really help us cut down on food waste, which I think people are starting to make the connection. Food waste is bad for the environment. It's not just you're wasting money or there's food that's not getting to people who are hungry, but it goes into landfills and it produces greenhouse gases. So this is a really important topic. So how can eggs help us cut down on food waste? So we already talked about the nutrient benefit of consuming your uh, eggs with your vegetables. And so it's another way for you also to kind of use what's left in your fridge. And so if you got some extra vegetables, get those vegetables before they go bad. Or, you know, you could make yourself a frittata or a vegetable-based frittata. Again, whatever ways we can use eggs as a vegetable delivery system Mm -hmm. is something that we are, we strongly encourage because there's so many different ways to do it. And it makes for such a a more savory, delicious dish. And there's a lot of different things you can throw in. We talked about cheese already. All the things in your fridge go with eggs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And use your eggs up before they go bad too. And like I said, I'll, I'll hard boil mine and I'll throw them on salads, of course, or my you know, egg salad sandwich, but also you can put eggs in soup as you're cooking soup. Oh, yeah. Um, Like egg drop soup. Egg drop soup or good ramen. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, it's funny. Okay. Confession. I do eat ramen noodles from time to time Mm -hmm. and I will drop an egg in there and it just makes it that much more nutritious. Yeah. The egg yolk is just so versatile and it just provides that sort of savoriness to so many different dishes. Mm -hmm. Yum, yum. Okay, so let's address some of the myths and misconceptions. Mm -hmm. So is there a difference between brown and white eggs? Is there any nutritional difference? Um, Why are they different colors? Enlighten us. For sure. Well, first of all, there's no nutritional difference. Brown eggs, white eggs, same nutrient package. It doesn't really matter on that front. The difference really is the hen. So the brown eggs come from the brown hens with the red earlobes. It's about the earlobes. That's where the brown eggs come from. And then the white hens produce the white eggs. It's, it's really that simple. There's really no nutritional difference between the two. And you know, a lot of folks might have a preference one way or the other, and that's perfectly fine. 
But you know, when it comes to the nutrient content, it's the same. Just the color of the the, the earlobes of the hen uh, really is is what drives the difference in, in the eggshell. I think that's so interesting. <laughs> the earlobes, right? And really, the only way to change the nutrient content of the egg is what you feed the hens. So. Could you briefly touch on like some of the eggs that are higher in omega threes? Yeah, yeah. So you see that a lot if you go to the supermarket. There's just there's you know, a lot of different, just like yogurt. There's a lot, so many different varieties of eggs, right? The only way to change the nutrient content is to change what the hens themselves are eating. And there are some of those options available in the market. So some eggs report on their packaging, you know, higher levels of vitamin E or higher levels of omega-3 fatty acids. That's because the farmers producing those eggs provided uh, a special feed to their hens that increased the level of nutrients. And that's it's a perfectly fine uh, way to go. Those eggs are going to be more expensive, generally mm-hmm. speaking. So, you know, we mentioned earlier the 15 cents for one large egg, you know, those nutrient enhanced eggs eggs are obviously going to be more than that. But depending on what you're looking for, those are good reasons to, might be good reasons to go that direction. They cost more to produce, so that's why they cost more at the store. Exactly. Okay. And then one more quick question. Uh, What about Mm -hmm. cage-free? Is there any difference as far as nutrition and cage-free? Cage-free, free range, all the different types of you know housing uh, options that you see. No, the nutrition, again, nutritionally speaking, no, there's no, no real difference. Again, the only nutritional differences we see are the ones where they specifically change the feed for the hens. We're starting to see a lot more cage-free options available. You know, I think, uh, you know, just talking to egg farmers, they're listening to consumers. They know consumers have certain expectations and, you know, there's more um, market for for cage-free. I think, you know, egg farmers are going to meet whatever demand is out there. So whether it's, you know, some folks just want to have, find the cheapest eggs that they can find, and that's great. Others want cage-free, others want nutritionally enhanced. I think the great thing is that we have those options. A lot of people have different demands and farmers are ready to meet those demands. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Well, in wrapping up, I'd like to see if you have any big takeaways or summary for our listeners, but also I want to highlight some of the awesome resources that the Egg Nutrition Center has and how people can connect on social media and also how health professionals can become an egg enthusiast. Why don't we start with any major takeaways or summary that you'd like to share? Yeah, I just, you know, like to summarize by saying eggs are a naturally nutrient-rich food. It's a nutrient package that is unlike any other. It's high in several nutrients that are actually hard to find in a lot of places like choline and lutein. And I think increasingly we're going to start hearing not just about the importance of nutrition for heart health and for diabetes health and uh, metabolic health, but increasingly there's a greater appreciation on neurocognition and eating for neurocognition. And I think a lot of different now, authoritative sources are recommending nutrients for neurocognition. We mentioned the AAP, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans for 2020 is re- reviewing the science in this area right now. It's just a, a really exciting area that's growing. And I think, you know, we're going to be hearing a lot more about it. Excellent. And, you know, this is a question I like to ask my guests. Um, so I'd like to give you an opportunity to address this as well. What do you say to people who criticize research that's funded by industry? This is actually a topic that I do really enjoy talking about. So, um, so I've been now working in industry now for oh my god, almost 15 years. Um, you know, in the last almost 10, uh, specifically, my main role is funding nutrition research, mostly at universities and providing sponsorship dollars. You know, whether it's here at Eggs or or in my previous position at Dairy. What our goal is, is to produce the best possible science that we can. And we have very strict guidelines about our role in that development of that research and then what happens uh, when that research is done. We want to, without question, keep the responsibility and the control of that research with those researchers, uh, those university professors that are doing that research. Everything that we do gets published no matter what the results that's actually written into our agreements with the universities, that everything gets published. There's no depends on this or that. No, everything gets published. If they can get it published, that's also it's a competitive process. So they have to go through that as well. 
And transparency is also obviously critically important. Everything that we do has to have a sponsored by uh, Egg Nutrition Center, American Egg Board's Egg Nutrition Center. So transparency is important, but keeping the control of that process with the researcher is also important. So when you know all those things, when you know that Egg Nutrition Center funded the project, uh, when you know that we have a very strict rule that keeping the control of that research with the investigator and that everything gets published, then I think you can judge the research on its merits. And then I think you could say, okay, well, is this a good study? Well, are there any flaws in this study? How does the study contribute to the broader context of the science? And what contribution does it make? What question does it answer? Uh, where does it fill a knowledge gap? Those are the questions that we should all be asking about whatever science that comes out, you know, no matter who sponsors it. Mm-hmm. But I think you can answer those questions with the knowledge that, okay, the transparency that this was industry funded, okay, fine. We understand that. We understand that there is a a certain process behind that that's open, transparent, and in the hands of the investigator. And then judge the science on its merits. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Well, Mickey, this has been really interesting talking with you. I can tell you are an egg enthusiast yourself. So I want to share some great resources for people where they can find more information People can go to eggnutritioncenter.org, but I especially wanted to highlight they have some wonderful materials, infographics, and videos, and also some continuing education opportunities, and I'll have specific links to that in my show notes. And people can follow on social media, particularly looking for the hashtag egg enthusiast. And if health professionals are interested in becoming egg enthusiasts, basically they're credentialed health, nutrition, and fitness professionals who love eggs and are interested in communicating compelling and accurate nutrition information, they can apply at eggnutritioncenter.org. And anybody who is an egg enthusiast will receive updates on emerging research, media-ready materials, and access to exclusive events. So I do encourage people to check that out. Like I said, I'll have links to all of this in my show notes at soundbitesrd.com. But Mickey, thank you so much for sharing all this great information. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure, Melissa. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. And for everybody listening, as always, enjoy your food with health in mind. Till next time. For more information, visit soundbitesrd.com. Music by Dave Burke.